welcome to session number five. If you've been uh, spending all day, morning, evening, afternoon, whatever uh, it is in, in, in your time zone, um, this is session number five. Topic for this session is the graph technologies. Um, we'll be talking about not only social networks or social distancing networks. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hans. I'm the um, uh, product manager for the spatial and graph uh, technologies based out of Hamburg in Germany. So I sit in the um, in the uh, region and that's my focus area. But with the outbound product management team, we're looking after all of you, wherever you are, no matter if you're in the Americas, in, in Asia Pacific, we have a colleague Toyota in based out of Bangkok, uh, looking after APAC. So uh, we should have someone uh, at least reasonably close to your your local time zone, and I'm not alone on this uh, on this session. Um, I'm joined by uh, Gianni Ceresa, um, who is uh, the managing director of Datalysis. And Gianni, you know, maybe you want to say a few words about yourself as well while I click to the next slide. Oh, Go. yeah. Welcome to this session. I'm Gianni, working in Switzerland mainly, but all around the planet, focusing on analytics, mainly Oracle, and on the side of analytics, graph. Uh, graph technologies, mainly Oracle as well, for a bunch of years already. And also an ACE director on, on the side, so hopefully I see you at some conference at some point soon as well. Yeah, hopefully if we have um, on-premise conferences again at some stage, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, now, topic for today is graph databases and graph analytics. And just to make clear one thing up front, when we say uh, graph analytics, we are not talking about um, uh, graph as in pie charts or in, in bar charts. What we're referring to uh, is something more like this, um, like in social networks, uh, as you can see here, um, this is a graph representing part of my LinkedIn network, or actually, um, as it was a couple of years ago when this uh, this little uh, experimental application uh, was up, right? So we're talking about graphs which represent entities as vertices in this logical structure and relationships between these entities as connections. And the fancy thing about graphs in general is that you can do interesting kinds of analysis of these types of relationships or dependencies or patterns. Like for example here, what you can see um, or what has been uh, determined automatically by the system is um, the importance of certain vertices. So contacts of mine who are bigger are more important as per the algorithm that determined the importance. It also tried to group my uh, contacts into communities. So those parts of the network which are more strongly interconnected are grouped into uh, communities. Um, and you can also see outliers, like sort of down here, you can see, you can see poor Eva, right? Eva is sort of connected only to myself, nobody else in my network. Well, that's, that's not a surprise because Eva is a, a friend of my wife's uh, and I don't have any connections professionally with her. So you can even see that by visually representing this. So this is the kind of thing uh, we will be uh, talking about in uh, the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, Johnny and I, we do have a bit of a plan of what we want to talk about. Um, so what we want to cover is, first of all, what are graphs in the first place? And in order to make that more understandable, we'll be talking about what are the, the typical use cases, then we'll cover what's Oracle going to do with it. And as most of you are coming from a relational background, I assume, uh, we will be talking or spending a little bit of time on how to move from a relational model to a graph model. And then if for whatever reason we still have a little bit of time, maybe we'll even talk about how graphs fit in with machine learning in order to uh, complement the session which uh, uh, Charlie Berger and uh, Brendan Tierney and uh, Jeff uh, were running two hours ago. Right, so that, that's the plan, right? We, we are planning to do this in a more interactive manner. You will see um, maybe a, a, a little less slides than you've seen in some of the other presentations. And uh, uh, so without, uh, without further ado, I would say let's, let, let's get started and maybe let me, let me 
start by by asking you, Johnny, uh, about your experience with graphs, and maybe you know, maybe even say about say where you've come across graphs for uh, the first time. Yeah, I will say that I came across graph without knowing that it was graph and without calling them graphs. I'm quite sure that everybody did the same. Uh, so I come from uh, analytics mainly. So my job is generally to understand the business need of a company of somebody and then translate it into analysis using data and so on. And when you speak with business people, so not IT or tech guys, they will not show you a professional database or whatever. They will just take a piece of paper and start draw, drawing on the paper with the workflow, the processes. Like, okay, we have a, a customer, then it will pass an order, then the order will go to the warehouse, we ship the things. And so they will just start adding boxes, lines, and things like that on a piece of paper. That's just a graph. So I did graph without calling them graph. It was just tell me what you need or tell me what you do and how you do it. And the graph was showing me, oh yeah, that's the process. These are the relationships. So the customer order a product, they order, the product is in a warehouse, there is a stock, there is some shipments and so on. That was really my first approach to graphs. Then the practical approach to graph when I really called them graphs was probably like four years ago when the Panama Papers came out. I guess it was in 2016, if I'm not wrong. I had an ex-colleague, Robin Moffat. He, he wanted to, to try to analyze Panama Papers by himself, and he did it with Oracle and using the graph in the database. And then I just started looking at his job and just following up and doing the same things and having a chat with him. And that's when I started doing my real first graph in Oracle at least. But before then, I just said, oh, I have boxes and arrows and lines and on a piece of paper, and it was already graphs. Yeah, excellent. That, that's, that's a very good example also to complement the social network example I was just referring to, because social networks create the impression that um, in a graph, you would only have one type of uh, entity. Well, that's not the case. Like in your, your, your workflow example, you would, you would have customers and products and orders and what have you. Or in the part of my papers, you, you have uh, a person connected to a bank account, which is used for a financial transfer to another bank account, which is owned by a company on the board of directors of which is the wife of the first person. And so you have a circular relationship, uh, which, which, you can, which you can use uh, to determine all these kinds of uh, fancy things. Uh, great stuff. Very interesting. I mean, I, I've been uh, c coming uh, into the area of graphs from a slightly different perspective. As I mentioned, I, I, I come from a geospatial background, and and there we would have uh, graphs, for example, in road networks or in, in utilities networks. Right? We we have in the Oracle database ever since uh, 10G release one, by the way, we have what we call the network data model, which is essentially a graph because it allows you to store a road network uh, or a utilities network in the database as nodes and edges. So you have every road segment as an edge and every street intersection as, as a node in the graph. And when we do shortest path calculations, how do I get from, from A to B? What's the fastest path? What's the, what's the shortest path? And so on. That's essentially a graph algorithm. I, I never thought of that being uh, uh, a sort of a graph thing back then, for me, this was the network data model. But yes, that's that's what, what we did uh, uh, back then. And, and by the way, we also expanded that into uh, the uh, semantic technologies. So we implemented the uh, resource description framework and everything around it in the RDF graph, or nowadays as we call it the knowledge graph um, model. But these two types of graphs, just for everybody to, to understand the, the spatial, uh, the network data model in spatial, and the um, RDF graphs. These are not the topic of uh, today's um, session. Right? We call them purpose-built graphs because they were designed for a, a specific uh, type of uh, use case. Here we're talking about what is generally known as property graphs, completely generic, uh, primarily designed to run uh, graph um, algorithms. Um, and uh, uh, that's something which we've only uh, implemented like five, four or five years uh, ago and then turned into, uh, into a product. Good, okay, so let's move on to um, 
the specifics of graphs and what you maybe also what you like about graphs. Uh, do you want to expand on that, Johnny? So for me, at least the main usage of graphs and how I see them fit into my daily business or daily work activities, it is most people, most companies look at their information. So they build analysis on data for traditional databases. So they have like some measures calculated things. They count people, they count money, they count revenues, things like that. And they have a bunch of attributes that they just split down the numbers by attributes. And they just look at these figures. A graph will add a let an extra layer on top of it because you start looking at the relationship between things. You start looking at the structure of information. So it's not a replacement of your rational database. It's not a replacement of your classical analytics or standard uh, reports and dashboards. It's a complement. You just extend it, giving a, to your same data a different shape, and then you look at them from a different point of view. Instead of looking in front, you just start looking from various sides. And so it's really just same data, but different question, and finding new answers that you couldn't easily find, or at least you, you maybe even didn't think about while sticking to your da rational database. So it's really just an expansion, an extension of standard analytics or rational databases. It gives you this extra dimension, this extra layer on top, I will say. Yeah, very good point. I, I, that, that's, I think, one of the, the key aspects because it allows us to do analytics, which otherwise in relational technology are either very cumbersome to do or impossible altogether. Um, what I actually personally also like a lot about graph technologies is uh, that uh, they are very easy on the modeling side, as you was uh, you were explaining already in your workflow example, right? Anything you can you can uh, draw on a on a piece of paper, anything you put onto a, a whiteboard, you can model as a graph. Um, and graphs, as such, are schema less, uh, so you can really build your model as you go along, as opposed to the relation technologies where you spend a lot of effort up front to design your, uh, your model uh, and you know, get all the bases uh, done properly. Here, you just you know add new vertices, new, new types of vertices as you go along, or you, you add a new type of relationship, um, uh, whatever you just need, and it doesn't break anything uh, which, which, you've, which you've done uh, before, right? Good, now when I started, with graph technologies, um, particularly when I was, you know, starting to look at the algorithms, um, I found much of that fairly confusing, to be to be honest. What did help me a whole lot back then was to look at use cases. Um, so maybe we'll move on to the use cases. So what 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 would be your favorite use cases? It's true that talking about graphs can still sound a lot theories and just words. If you see a graph, it just make it a lot more easy so my what i like this in the last like two or three years as a use case it's you're maybe aware in europe there's been a new a new uh, law coming in for that has been enforced the gdpr the global data protection like re regulation so it's this thing that say companies cannot use or abuse customer and user information anymore so the user is the owner of the information and it must allow the company to process it and so on and one of the aspects to truly really be able to do a GDPR assessment is you need to have a full data lineage of, your, of everything happening in your company because data is created somewhere. It's maybe a website where somebody entered an order. From there, you go to your database. Then you have an ETL process that just take the data out of the database, move it around, transform it, store it somewhere else. On top of that, you maybe have a dashboard. And then you have an employee that is in front of his screen just click on a button and they download the, the, the dashboard and they do something with it. And GDPR requires you, require you as a company to be able to know who is accessing the information for what reason, for example. So having a full data lineage is mandatory. And if you think at, a, at just the, the data itself, how it flow around the company, it is a graph. If you think at a, data, a database, parent-child relationship, a table is part of a database, a table has columns. If you think at ETL, you have a source column, you have some transformation, or just maybe nothing because you're moving, and you have a target. So it's all about nodes, vertices, this round, arrows that represent the transformation of the relationship, and then you, you, keep, you can keep going till the dashboard itself. You have maybe a, a model doing, built in your uh, appendical application, 
And then on top of that, you have a nice uh, table or a nice chart and these things. And then the question is, for example, okay, I have a sensible column in my database. I must make sure that nobody can access it or at least only given people can access it. How can I do that? Uh, mm, good question. Without a graph, you end up opening your database, checking all the grants on your columns, finding out which other object use it. Then you go to the ETL guide, you ask him, can you tell me, please, of the ETL processes that use this thing, that move it around? And then you keep going, and maybe after like a few days, you end up to somebody that tell you, oh, it's an analytical tool, we just have it everywhere because it was nice to, to get it there. And with a graph, if you can just show the next slide, it, you can do all the things easily. In a full data lineage, you can represent it with a graph. You can say, okay, I have a column. In this case, it's a blue dot on the right side of the screen. Say, oh, this one, it's a sensible column. I must find out who is using it and where. And we just like a query or just a bunch of clicks saying, navigate the graph, please. Take me along the edges, take me along the graph where it goes. And I say, this column, which is a sensible one, end up being in 58 or 60, can't remember, all the green dots on the left, which are dashboards objects. I say, yeah, that's an email, uh, that's maybe the email address of customers. There are 60 dashboards showing it. Doesn't sound like right. And it's probably not really legal anymore. So, okay, I have to take this 60 and clean them up. It can sound easy, but on this screen, I just see like 70, 75 objects. The full data lineage is few millions. If you think at the full company, data lineage is just a nightmare because of the amount of information you have, the amount of relationship between data all around the company. A graph, one click, you can get full, co full coverage of, okay, this column is just there, there, and there. You go through this step, this step, this steps. So it's extremely a simple use case. Another use case that maybe speak more to database people, I, it's not something I did myself, it's something that uh, another ACE director, Ludovico Caldara, did. He was working at CERN and he was in charge of databases and he was trying to find out how to, how to just reorganize the database, how to consolidate them, how to move schemas around, how to move tables around. And he found out there was just a big mess with a huge database with a tons of things inside. It was uh, impossible to maintain because yeah, it had to be up all the time. Just using graphs, he could find out, okay, all these schemas are extremely correlated to each other. They have a lot of links joining between the schemas, so I must keep them together. While this other set of schemas, they are extremely detached. They are not really connected to the other one, so I can create it two databases. It makes maintenance easier. It's a smaller databases to upgrade and, uh, and back up all these things. So thanks to graph analysis, the Wiko was able to just say, okay, based on security, based on relationship inside the database, I could easily structure my consolidation saying, not one big database, but just few smaller ones based on correlation and relationship between data. And that's something that the graph allowed him to do while without, it was a huge Excel file with just a few hundred thousand rows inside. Say, I cannot see anything. The graph, so a picture, say, oh, it's obvious. It just split around. Yeah, excellent. I think these are very you know, common use cases, this, de this kind of dependency analysis, be it in IT components, or as you were just saying, in the context of GDPR, having the kind of uh, security figuring out which user through which role has access to which dashboard, which in turn sits on top of which view, which sits on top of which table, which has which column. This kind of analysis in a relational form alone would would be what a six way, a seven way join or something, uh, which is just extremely cumbersome. And here uh, with the graph database, uh, this is something which we can deal with um, very easily. I don't know uh, if that's clear already to, to others, what the difference is between a graph database uh, and a relational database. But the, the, the fundamental technical difference is that we're storing the relationship as a, as a first class object in uh, the database, which allows us to traverse the graph um, very quickly and very easily, which in relational technologies will always mean you do a join, right? And with this explicit storage of the relationship, you can do you know, these shortest path analysis, the reachability analysis, which we were just talking about in the context of um, GDPR 
Uh, is there any connection between this column and that user over so many hops? Uh, this kind of thing uh, can be calculated extremely quickly. Right, these, this is sort of one class of, or these are two classes of, of applications, the kind of you know, security, cybersecurity, um, uh, dependency analysis, and, and so forth. Um, another relatively large group of our users are in the financial services industry. And uh, uh, what they do in, in, in that space, besides customer 360 type of uh, applications and targeted marketing type of applications, is fraud detection. And um, I've brought an example here, which was recently presented at the Analytics and Data Summit by one of our customers, the, the Paysafe group, um, who are offering e-payment services and, uh, and e-wallets. And that's just a very nice example showing uh, how graph analysis can be used to um, identify um, behavioral patterns, undesired behavioral patterns or fraudulent patterns uh, in money transfers. So if we take the example on the left-hand side, um, what the, the, the dots represent is e-wallets and what the links are are financial transfers. Now, if you have this e-wallet on the left-hand side being some arbitrary user and the yellow one down here maybe being a betting site uh, which has a limit of well, let's say ten dollars per bet now if this person here wants to uh, uh, spend five hundred dollars uh, betting what he can do is he just opens 50 e-wallets 50 um, accounts so to speak transfers ten dollars uh, ten dollars each and then again ten dollars to that uh, betting site and works around the limitation. Of course, that is an undesired pattern. And graphs are just very good at identifying these. Right? This is something you could do with relation technologies as well. It's not rocket science, but here we have the advantage that we're storing the relationship explicitly, which makes it very fast to do these kinds of analysis. As I said, this is a relatively simple example. On the right-hand side, we have a more complex one, which the team from uh, Paysafe kindly shared with us, and that, uh, again, is working along the same lines. We have one uh, source of all the money and one, uh, one sink, so to speak. And just from the fact that lots of transactions are being used to essentially transfer money from down here to the sink indicates that somebody is trying to hide something in huge amounts of data. And this is the kind of thing uh, which the team uh, at Paysafe are trying to identify. And that's where with relational technologies, you're just hitting limits. Uh, and I'll show you an example uh, a little further down. OK, so we've been talking about what are graphs. And we've touched on a few use cases, the GDPR, the dependency analysis, the fraud detection. So maybe um, let's move on to the Oracle technologies, what's Oracle going to do with it? So, uh, John, do you want to say a few words about the, the high-level architecture of um, the, the graph technologies? So, I can, but if you don't mind, there's a question that came in just ah, in the meantime. I, okay, and, uh, I missed that I, I one. Be, yeah, I believe it's linked to the GDPR uh, aspects because it is how much time did it take to feed the, the graph with the right data for the flow of an attribute. So, I take it as the, in the GDPR context of the the full data lineage aspects, how can an attribute flow through the graph and how can it be built into the graph? The time is not really, it doesn't really take time to get it into the graph. It takes time to get the metadata out of the various tools that you use. That's the challenging part. And it really all depends on the tool that you have. From an Oracle database with a bunch of queries, you can almost easily get all you need. In an ETL tool, it's already a bit more tricky, depending on the tool, you can easily query it or not. If then you think about Oracle Analytics Cloud or another Oracle Analytics platform, it's a bit more challenging. I'm doing these things for 10 years, so I have a bunch of scripts around that do all that job for me. So I will say, now, nowadays, right now, from A to Z, it takes like a few minutes, and the information is there. When you start from scratch, getting the metadata, it's the complicated part, and you will see later in the soul how you can turn this thing into a graph. You will start this part, creating the graph itself, it's easy. It's getting the source data that it's the challenge. 
Yeah, good point. And maybe a good opportunity also to emphasize that, as you just mentioned, uh, you have a bunch of scripts to extract the relevant information from uh, the Oracle metadata structures of the Oracle Analytics Cloud or the Oracle BI repository. So that you can, for example, for the purpose of GDPR, can extract all the relevant bits and pieces. Good, good point. Yeah. The other question, <laughs> yes, go ahead. Was that a question? Uh, yeah. No, so we don't have any other questions. So if you have uh, some. Yeah. Well, there was another one, which maybe also you want to answer uh, because you've ju done just that. There was a question and I've, I've, I've lost it because it's been answered in the meantime, a question about using the Oracle uh, graph visualization tool in conjunction with um, the autonomous database Freesia. Uh, and I believe you've been playing around with that a little bit. So maybe you can comment on how, how quickly or how, how difficult or how easy that was. I would say it's easy part of it because the free, the free tier I take it, the always free offering, there you get the autonomous database and that part cover the, even the storage of the graph easily. That's the simple part. The challenging part is the graph side of things. In the always free offering, you don't really have enough resources to create a real graph server because you just have not enough memory. So it will be extremely slow and extremely complicated. So we'll say use the always free database, but then run the graph components, like on your laptop, for example, and just connect your database. And I use actually this answer to explain also the slide that we see, it's, which is the like, structure of PJX, so the, the graph engine. Oracle, they, they developed a, a nice thing, I must say. They really created a, a little engine, like a, a brain for property graph. It's not just part of a huge other product. It's really a, like an independent, an independent little engine. It do, do all the in-memory graph job. And here you can see that it's a two-layer thing. So you have the graph in-memory analytics engine, the top block, which is really in-memory, and full support for graph algorithms, graph management, and graph operations. Next to it, they added a, a storage management. Instead of redeveloping things, instead of reinventing the wheel, they say, we are not going to reinvent a full storage management system. We just create connectors that link to existing storage options. That's why all the storage layer, it's outside of the graph engine itself. It can connect to a database, it can connect to big data with uh, uh, Hive and other things. And for a sandboxing option, you can also use flat files. And then how can you speak with this little engine? Here again, they took the simplest option ever. They didn't invent 1,100 interfaces. They say, let's be modern, a REST web service. The graph analytics engine speak REST. Everything is REST-based. You can use REST with every single language, Java, Python, JavaScript, whatever. Any kind of language nowadays speak REST in a way or another. So you can easily connect to the graph engine from whatever you have already. The engine will do the job in memory, will store an existing solution that you already have. And then on the other side, they also just added some visualization connector on the R integration, the Spark integration, to make things a bit easier, a bit more integrated with also some other Oracle tools. But the engine itself, it's really like a standalone product. It's independent. And then it just connect to other pieces of your environment by REST or by uh, SQL or by uh, other option for the storage layer. So it's really extremely well done and nicely it's, it's really easy to use in any context, I will say. Great. Great. So that also covers the question of how does that work with the free tier, right? The free tier yeah. we would recommend as the storage layer underneath. Uh, and then the graph analytics engine, you could run either on your uh, local machine or you would use um, uh, an OCI compute instance uh, to, to stand up uh, a, a Java runtime environment. Uh, excellent. Yes, good point. Um, in the graph analytics engine, um, uh, we do have storage structures which we don't have in the database, or at least not in the database yet, which we need uh, to be able to run these scalable uh, graph algorithms and, and run them in, in parallel, uh, which is uh, why we have separated the storage layer from, from uh, the analytics. You can, and that brings us to the, the, the second part of, of the architecture, you can um, run this, uh, as Johnny was just explaining, with uh, the storage layer and the in-memory analytics engine from, uh, um, you know, controlled from, from some client. There are 
certain sets of functionalities. For example, you can do you know, simple graph traversal uh, on the basis of the database, right? With the latest um, um, uh, release of our graph server and client kit, we've actually now made it possible to use um, the property graph visualization component um, in identical form with the memory analytics engine as well as with the database. So you can run PGQL, the property graph query language, which we use to extract information from the graph um, uh, in an identical form against uh, these two uh, layers, um, which means you can do you know, graphs and graph analysis uh, right on the database. But of course, um, the memory analytics engine uh, is specifically designed to to do these things in uh, uh, on the basis of the storage structures I was just referring to, meaning it is a lot faster. But of course, right, if you have an in-memory analytics engine, that always means you need to synchronize the graph, right? If there's any changes, we do the changes down in the graph store. Um, the analytics engine is like in a data warehouse environment. It is, um, a, by and large, a read-only environment at the moment, uh, and you need to synchronize the changes that we do on a, on a regular basis, um, um, periodically, like every couple of minutes or once a day or whatever. Yeah, I, that's why I mean, when you use the in-memory engine, it's not a real-time approach, it's really more a snapshot-based analysis. You take a snapshot of the situation at a given point in time, you do your in-memory analysis, then you can refresh it and keep going. It's not real-time. That's really the, the difference between the two sides, I will say, of the slide. Correct. And that actually brings us to the topic of uh, computational graph analysis, because if, if you have mutating graphs and you run uh, like a complex algorithm, uh, like a, a centrality algorithm, like between the centrality or something which is you know, compute intensive, you don't want to change the graph underneath because then it invalidates all your, your calculations. So uh, from, from that perspective, uh, that's the, the, the approach um, uh, we've taken. So maybe um, uh, do you want to say a few words about what you can do on the um, algorithm side with... So yeah, because I mean, having a graph is nice, but just having a graph to have one, it's, yeah, that's not really useful. The real power of graphs, you maybe remember when you were like in school, you had in a mathematics class, graph theories. So graphs are really based on mathematical theories. And you can leverage these theories to get extremely powerful algorithms. Out of the box, the in-memory engine that Oracle give you come with about 60 algorithms with all the variants. They can do a bunch of, a bunch of things. You can do like uh, link prediction, you can do matrix factorization, you can do ranking and walking, you can do some structure evaluation, you can do machine learning, you will be able to do machine learning, you can do link prediction, community detect detection, you, there are a bunch of algorithms. The documentation is really nicely done. They explain you all these things. And the, the most simple use case, and everybody knows it, did you know, do you know what is PageRank? Did you ever use Google, for example? Google, when it started, was clearly PageRank, trying to connect search of a result of a, of a, results of a search query by how pages are connected to each other. A web page that has a tons of links coming in means that this page must be good and interesting and important. So we just make it first in the ranking of the, in the results. So page rank is a way to find the most important, I will say, pieces of a graph by the number of links that come in. Page rank by itself, okay, works for Google, but in uh, daily life, you will not really do page rank. What is more interesting, for example, is how can you find similar similarities or anomalies? Anomalies detection, which is just, I would say, the opposite of the similarities in a way. It is, how can I find similar things in my graph? When I have a graph with millions of objects inside, how can I find out what, uh, what is similar to each other just because of the graph structure? You can use the personalized, personalized page rank. So it is just page rank itself, but by giving an extra accent on start from this part of the graph. That's the personalization. You say start from this piece of the graph and then start calculating the page rank all around the graph. The final result, you get a score, you get a number that tell you, okay, all these other objects are fairly similar to what you gave me as the starting point because they have a high score. 
while all these other objects are really, have a really slow score, so they are quite not really looking like the first one. In this way, you can use it, for example, to suggest products. When somebody is buying something, you can say similar products or similar customer bought these things. Or on the other side, anomalies, you just calculate all the objects that looks like being the same, and when they're inside, you find somebody or so or an order that has nothing to do there. That's an anomaly. It was not supposed to be there. But the graph tells you, based on page rank, this object looks extremely similar to all the others, while it has nothing to do there. So all the algorithmical part, all the algorithms that you get with uh, graph, uh, the, the memory engine, is really what gives you the extra power, you say the superpower in, in the graph approach. And it's extremely simple to use because you execute the graphs, sorry, you execute the algorithms, and then you just query for the result. And the query side is ANS. Yeah, is PGQL, correct. Yes, that brings us sort of to the next topic. But maybe to expand on this question of algorithms, right? You were just referring to the, um, to the page rank algorithm, uh, which basically is one measure of importance. Um, uh, here, we've got an example uh, where we're looking at another uh, centrality algorithm, which is called betweenness uh, centrality. Uh, it is also one of these centrality algorithms that looks at the importance of um, um, a vertex in the graph, but a different kind of importance. Uh, here in this case, the algorithm emphasizes those vertices in the graph, which are specifically sitting between communities. Right? So this can be very important for, for, for example, uh, project teams uh, where you, know, you have one uh, project team working on one project, another project team uh, working on something else. And if there's only one person that is involved in both projects, this person can be very important because he's the, the only link uh, making sure that these pro uh, projects are, um, uh, are in line. And so by means of the graph algorithm called between this centrality, you can figure out using the entities and relationships which of the people in the graph or which of the vertices in the graph uh, are particularly important in the context of sitting between communities. And here, for example, the example uh, the, what, what, what you see here is a little example graph from the Marvel characters, uh, and it looks at two communities and one character in the middle. What we see here, just uh, to give you a visual impression, kind of similar to what Johnny was talking about in the GDPR use case, is our graph visualization component. And as Johnny was just alluding to, what we're using this component for is to extract the graph from either the engine or from the, the graph store, and then visually representing it with you know a few tricks and visualization uh, uh, um, optimizations where you can color vertices appropriately, you can label things, and increase the size depending on importance and, and this kind of thing. But the, the key functionality which this is based on is it, the tool extracts the relevant part of the graph. And that brings us to the topic of graph query languages, which, which in itself is a big and, and relatively uh, important topic. Um, at the moment, there are no standards in this space. Um, so uh, we are currently working with um, the, uh, uh, the ISO working group, uh, which is also responsible for the SQL standard, to define what is known as SQL PGQ, so an uh, um, extension to uh, the SQL uh, language which covers uh, property graph technologies um, and we are um, proposing um, the property graph query language there are uh, sort of similar approaches from from other vendors and we're in the process of agreeing on what this will look like this is sort of ongoing activity and may, maybe we'll even have that in the SQL 2021 standard um, I hope we can get it out in, in time. Um, what you can see here is um, the um, query um, expression which we're using to extract um, the graph from the graph store, which kind of looks like SQL. It is relatively similar to SQL, right? You have a select statement, you have a where clause, you have an order by, there is limit, there is a uh, group by, and, and all these kinds of constructs. The main difference to a normal SQL query 
uh, which makes it usable for, for graphs is that we have a what we call the match clause, which basically allows us to specify a pattern, um, which is then uh, used as uh, the subgraph to match against. Right? What I mean by this is um, uh, we need a way to specify how vertices, vertices of different types, maybe are connected to other vertices through given connections and, and so forth. So in this example here, what we have uh, is um, one uh, um, uh, query which explicitly looks at um, a starting point, which is a vertex in, in round brackets, which is connected through an edge E0 to another vertex, which in turn is connected through an edge to a third vertex, right? So with this pattern, this is, this is a very simple pattern here, but with this uh, pattern uh, matching query, we can extract information from uh, the graph and you can do all kinds of uh, fancy uh, constructs in, uh, in this match clause in particular, or in, in PGPO in, uh, in, in general to extract um, relevant uh, information from, uh, from the graph. And we can do that, as I said, uh, against the database or against the in-memory analytics engine now with the latest release of the visualization tool. And just to give you an idea of how powerful that is, coming back to the example I was referring to earlier, which is the, uh, the work the PaySafe group uh, uh, are doing, um, PaySafe, in order to run their um, uh, run their analysis, uh, were trying to analyze the financial transactions, and they have about 500 transactions per day, um, the financial transactions among all these e-wallets um, by using SQL. And uh, the SQL statement they, they developed um, was uh, looking at vertices, so looking at e-wallets, up to four hops away from the customer they were currently investigating, right? Which would normally be a four-way uh, four um, join with a couple of uh, constraints and so forth. They uh, designed a SQL query, and I can tell you, uh, the, the PaySafe team, uh, they are no amateurs. They are pretty good at this stuff. They came up with a SQL query, uh, 32 lines of uh, SQL code, and they ran this on around about 500,000 uh, transactions, uh, so one day's worth of financial transactions. And in order to do the analysis, this four hop query, that took 50 minutes to run, over 50 minutes to run. When they extended the data set from one day to one week, it just didn't finish. So they, they asked us to help um, um, and the, the Oracle team came up with an optimized SQL query, and it was way faster afterwards, which was great. Uh, they managed to run uh, the analysis on a single day's worth of data in 20 seconds, one week in eight, eight and a half minutes, but one month was still not feasible. And then uh, they said, okay, let's try this on a graph environment. And there's two important aspects here. One, the, the query in PGQL uh, right. this, this, you're not supposed to be able to read this, but this is the 64 or 62 lines worth of uh, SQL code which they used. They could express the very same query in just seven lines of PGQL because all they wanted to do essentially was a looking at all connections from one starting vertex uh, up to from, from zero to four hops away to other vertices. And and a couple of prerequisites here, so a couple of predicates here. Um, and so that's the one aspect. It's a way more compact, a very powerful uh, way to express this kind of connected queries. Plus, when they ran this against uh, uh, our um, uh, graph analytics engine, running that seven line PGQL query took about uh, half a second on one day's worth of data. It took a little over half a second in one week's worth of data, and it took under 0.6 seconds in one month's worth. So that is just extremely scalable. It gives you an idea of, um, of what is doable uh, in, in this space. Right, so I hope this has given everybody an idea. Um, and in the interest of time, uh, I think we need to move on to graph modeling just quickly uh, in order to uh, almost wrap up on, on the topic. 
as we, as we said earlier, um, we assume that most of you are coming from a relational background. So, Johnny, maybe you can say a few words about how you can move from a relational tabular model to a graph. So, yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple because, as you said, it's schemaless. So, in a graph, you only have two kinds of objects. You have the vertices and you have the edges. So, from your relational database, you only have to identify what is going to become a vertex and what is going to become an edge. And this is, there are not really universal rules for that. It all depends on what kind of analysis you want to do. Just how you build your relational database to answer one given question, a need, maybe a data, data warehousing approach with dimensional modeling and so on, the graph is similar. So you will create vertices, edges, or just store things as properties based on the kind of analysis you do. But you really start from a piece of paper, you just defining what is a vertex, what is an edge, what are the kind of relationship, and then you keep going. It's really an iterative approach. Because you can start in a given way, in a direction, then you find out that you need to change. You, can, you don't have to drop everything and restart, you just start moving on that direction, you start adapting, you start changing, and at some point you will have the new structure that's there, and you just keep going in an iterative approach, changing things one after the other. It's all about defining what is a vertex, what is an edge, and what is stored as a property into a vertex or an edge. It's extremely simple, and a piece of paper is the best way to start, really. Yeah, good, good point. Uh, also, I mean, sometimes if, 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 I, if I look at um, vertices which have certain properties, sometimes the question is what do I consider to be a property or does it make sense to represent a property as an individual kind of vertex uh, or vice versa? Uh, all of that you can try out, play around with, uh, and it is usually an iterative approach as you, as you were just saying. I mean, the, the, the general rule uh, from from my perspective, or the, the starting point, which we usually uh, you know uh, use, it, coming from a relational uh, environment, is that mostly every row in a in a sort of normal table, every entity would become a vertex, um, and whenever I have a primary key foreign key relationship, that would probably turn into um, an edge. But there may be exceptions. Sometimes you may want to expand on that. Yeah. That makes uh, sense. Yeah, go ahead. I will say the exception is when you have bridge tables. Correct. When you have end-to-end -end relationship, so you have a bridge table in between, that one in a database, you must create a bridge table. In a graph, it's just an edge. Correct. Exactly. That's really yeah. the, the main exception. Indeed, yes. And, and you know, if, if the uh, intermediate table has, has columns, uh, you would maybe uh, represent them as properties on the edge. Correct. Now, in order to make that easy, uh, what we've done in uh, the um, uh, property graph query language is now to also specify what we call PGQL DDL, which allows you to basically take your relational model, convert that into the appropriate graph structures in the database, uh, and also populate uh, the, the structures. And uh, if you know SQL DDL, this will look kind of familiar to you. Uh, you have a create property graph statement, uh, but then you need to specify, okay, what are my vertices? What are my edges? Right? You have Here you have vertex tables, um, and uh, you specify the properties, except maybe some other, uh, some things which are columns in, in the table. You have another uh, vertex table uh, where you also, you know, use all columns um, and a third one. So you can f create the appropriate data structures, uh, from the relational tables and from the primary key relationships, uh, you can create the edges. Like if you have uh, an employee table and you have the employee works in a department, uh, you can have uh, works at uh, as a type of relationship and then maybe have some, some, some properties on it and, and specify, okay, this connects uh, the employee um, table, employee ID, um, uh, with the department, right? So that's one way uh, how we've tried to make this easy. And just to expand on that, uh, we have in the plans an extension to the autonomous data warehouse, which would uh, cover the, um, the the graph capabilities, which uh, uh, will be a fully managed uh, uh, graph cloud service 
as part of ADW, uh, and that will come with tooling to actually make this modeling uh, automated and uh, comes with graphical UI and, and so on, uh, just, just to do that. Just as a, as a bit of an, an outlook, outlook, what we have planned uh, to, to make available later this year. Good. So that I think wraps up on the graph modeling. You sounded like, or you looked like you wanted so to say just, something. Just, just as a reference for this PGQL, it's a lot more powerful than what you can imagine just seeing it on our slide. Like I did the example of building a graph by hand in a database. It took me using the sales history simple schema. Took me twenty something queries with temporary tables, sequences, and a bunch of other things to get unique IDs and technical constraints. PGQL, PGQL DDL, one single uh, statement, executed, wait a few minutes, all done. Mm. It takes care of all the details. You just have to really say, this is a vertex, this is a property, this is an edge, these are the properties. You just define those things, and it does all the job for you. No need to care about the constraints, unique values, and so on. It's extremely powerful. Yeah, okay, great. Thank, thanks for highlighting that. that. That pretty much brings us to the wrap up. Uh, so do you want to summarize what we've been, been talking about here? Oh, yeah, I mean, keeping it simple, property graph in general and with Oracle, it's not a replacement of your database. It's really an extension. It will complement your relational database. It gives you a different point of view on the same information. It gives you an advantage for other jobs like machine learning. Charlie was presenting about that with Jeff and Brandon before. If you think about features for machine learning, if you can extend it by adding all the connection, all the structure of the relationship of data, you clearly get a better machine learning model. So the graph allow you to get this information out as well quite easily. What you get with Oracle and the Oracle Graph Analytics Engine, this little nice independent component that do the job in memory, full API, fully documented, Javadoc, it's awesome, REST API, you can do everything with any single language. But 58 pre-built algorithms, they also give you the source code so you can customize them. You can add your own algorithms code. That's extremely awesome and powerful. And it's just super scalable. Sure, it's in memory, but it can also work on a cluster. So you can get multiple servers to just keep up and growing with your graph if you really need it. Then you also have integrations. So we saw on the slide with the for the graph analytics engine, there is the integration with Spark, with R, and with the relational database, but it's really fully integrated for storage and management of the graph when it's stored there. And then the last option, obviously it's not only cloud, it's also on-premises. It's in the database since 12 release two, if I'm not wrong. So on-premises or cloud, uh, autonomous database, it's there. The, the database of service in the cloud, it's there. On premises, it's there if it's a 12 CR2. So you have no reason to not use it, honestly. <laughs> Good point. Yes, excellent. Thank, thanks a lot, Gianni. Um, if um, you found this uh, uh, interesting in terms of you know, what, what uh, type of content we're offering now, all free of charge, as, as we were saying in the beginning, it's all part of what used to be the spatial graph option, which is now free with every database or every cloud service. Um, Here's a few links with further information. Uh, we, of course, have a couple of things on uh, oracle.com. Um, we have blogs. And what I specifically wanted to highlight is uh, the Ask Tom session, the upcoming Ask Tom session, specifically on financial services uh, use cases. We'll not be talking about the uh, PaySafe example there, but uh, another uh, financial services customer, which we're working with. Um, you can find us on social media. And one thing I would like to highlight there is um, there is um, the Oracle Spatial Graph group on LinkedIn. That's not uh, only managed by us as the Oracle PM team, but it's also um, driven by the um, Oracle uh, Spatial Graph Special Interest Group of the IOUG. So uh, this is basically where the community comes together virtually. Um, we do have um, a couple of videos up on uh, YouTube, which you can use maybe to get an idea of what our graph visualization component looks like, or what graphs uh, are about all together. Or if you want to do hands-on, there's two options. One, you can simply go uh, here and download uh, the latest um, uh, 
graph server and client kit to run on your uh, local machine connecting to whatever ADW free tier or uh, your local uh, Oracle database, whatever you, you have. Um, or uh, we've also made available uh, a tutorial. Um, this tutorial is, I have to say, to some degree, still work in progress. Um, uh, but at the moment, it's primarily uh, designed to show you how this is all being set up. In this case, we've been using Docker also for, for uh, setting up the, the environment. And you'll find uh, a notebook, a Zeppelin-based notebook, um, uh, which shows you an end-to-end -end, uh, analysis with uh, a couple of examples. From my, point, uh, my perspective, Johnny, thank you very much for spending the time with us. Thanks for you know, the, the work going into this, preparing for, for today's session. It's been a great pleasure for me to have you uh, on this webcast. To all the, uh, the participants, if you found this session interesting, you've hopefully got a, a couple of ideas of, of where you can follow up on this. If you found it terribly confusing, if you have no idea what this is all about, then maybe one thing uh, as, as the key takeaway, which, which you know, I, I would like to, to emphasize is uh, that whenever you're analyzing relationships, think graphs. That's, that would be my, my recommendation. Uh, we've hopefully shown you a couple of ideas what we mean by relationships. It's dependencies, if it's you know, fraud and uh, pattern matching and the like. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope it's been useful. Uh, thank you very much. We will be on uh, the uh, Slack platform uh, for another moment. Well, and then with that, uh, Tammy, over to you. Thank you, Hans and Gianni. That was fantastic. I really appreciate all the great information and thank you guys for all your time today.